Okay, well, my name is Michael Solomon. Welcome to the seminar on estate and income tax planning for 2021. Uh, I'm going to wait just one more minute or two more minutes to see uh, if anyone else wants to join uh, the um, seminar. And um, uh, also, I'm going to start, I uh, will take questions as it go along. I think it pops up on my screen if you do ask questions. So feel free to ask. Um, And my name, by the way, is Michael Solomon. I think it shows that it's Lori Steiner. That's my law partner who set up the system for us. But uh, my name is Michael Solomon. So you should all have on your screen the outline that I'm going to talk off of. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll be glad to take questions. I, I believe if you write them in, I will. it'll pop up on my screen. It did last time. So hopefully it'll do it this time. And I will... Uh, Okay, so I'm going to start. So um, we're going to talk about estate and income tax planning for 2021, and I'm going to skip right to the uh, third, uh, the fourth page. Um, well, let me the third page first. So estate planning in 2021. Okay, my background again. I do a lot of estate and tax planning, and uh, the big issue nowadays are people. What do we do now? We still don't know where the law is going. Do we do anything special in 2021? So that's the first question. So the existing law, the law that exists as of this moment, there's a federal exemption from the federal estate tax of $11.7 million per person. And for a married couple, that means it's 23,400,000. So most Americans don't have any issue with the federal estate tax. There is no Ohio estate tax, by the way. So if you're an Ohio resident, they got rid of that like a decade ago. So there's no Ohio estate tax. And for most Americans, there is no, uh, there is no death tax at the Ohio level. Additionally, on your passing, all of your assets, except for deferred monies, receive what's called an income tax step up in basis. And what that means is if you bought Google stock at a dollar and it grew to $1,000 and you gave it away, and the people who's your children, unless you gave it to your children, they sold it, they pay capital gains. If you sold it, you'd pay capital gains. But if you died holding that Google stock, there is no capital gains. It's all wiped out. So, the um, you know, so that's the law as it exists right now. I'm just trying to see. Yes, okay. So that's the law as it exists right now. Now there is no step up of income tax basis for IRAs, 401ks, any sort of retirement plans, or any annuities except annuities that were bought a long time ago. Um, so I've got my first question, so I'll take it. Now I know the question system works, so I see them come in. If a decedent was an Ohio resident, but the beneficiary lives in another state, is there a state tax that beneficiary? It, it, okay, so if you name the state tax or the death tax is on the owner of the assets, the original owner, the decedent. So it doesn't matter where the money goes, the estate tax is going to be incurred in the state where the decedent is domiciled. So since there's no, there's no Ohio estate tax, you could send $100 million in an IRA to a beneficiary and there's no Ohio estate tax and the recipient pays no uh, death tax at all. Now, whether they pay income taxes, that's a whole nother thing. So now let's go on to the next page. So that's the existing law. So now, Biden has, in his, when he was campaigning, proposed uh, some many potential changes. One of them is to reduce the exemption from the present level of $11.7 million to $3.5 million, and then increase the tax rate. The maximum rate right now on estate taxes is 40% increased to 45%. Now, whether he gets that, you know, with the Congress, uh, the Senate tied 50-50, and the House pretty close, no one knows, but that's what he is thinking of. That's a significant change from the exemption. And that would put a lot of people in a potential estate tax situation. Now, if Congress does nothing, the existing tax law expires at the end of 2025. This is what was passed the first year of the Trump administration. And because of the way that the tax laws work, they never last more than 10 years before they revert to the old law. So in 2026, unless Congress does something, we revert to the old exemption which at that time in 2016 was around a little over $5 million and it's adjusted for inflation. So I made an estimate, I could be way off, but using around a 2% rate of inflation, 
the exemption will be somewhere between six to six and a half million dollars in 2026 if Congress does nothing. So right now the exemption is 11.7 million a person. Biden's thinking of reducing it to three and a half million a person. And if no one does anything in 2026, it goes to around six to six and a half million dollars a person. So that's number one. Number two, Biden is proposing or may propose, I should say, to eliminate the income tax step up and basis rules. No one has any idea what that may look like. The only hint we may have is back in Bush number two's administration, they, when they eliminated the federal estate tax for one year in 2010, they also eliminated the step up and basis rules, except the first $1.3 million of assets we get a step up or if it was to a spouse, 3 million. But no one knows what Biden is gonna do. Uh, so that's one potential. There's another potential. He may limit the amount of gifts that you can make income tax, excuse me, the amount of gifts you can make tax-free, gift tax-free to a million dollars per person. Plus, in addition, there's an annual exclusion of 15,000. So if you had a large estate and you were worried about estate tax, if you gave away more than a million, you're going to pay a gift tax. So it, it, it forces people to hold on to their money. So that's that, and no one knows when that would happen. And also no one knows what the effective date would be. It could be a, a retroactive to the beginning of this year, 2021. So if Congress adopts something, let's say in June or July or August of 2021, these changes, if they want, could be effective as of January 1. Now the questions come in, so I'll see what that is. Um, oh, I was just wishing they had hundred million dollars, okay. so. Um, so that's the uh, Biden proposals, or I should say not proposals because he hasn't officially proposed it yet, but that's what people think he's going to propose. Now, let's go to the next slide. So let's assume you don't have a federal estate tax issue. Your estate is either under, you know, under the, clearly under the 11 million, but even if they make the change, you're well under the three and a half million dollars. You're not worried about federal estate tax. Should you do anything? And we recommend you review your existing wills and trusts if you have them. First of all, if you had a trust that was drafted in the 1990s when the exemption was as low as 600,000, they were designed to avoid federal estate tax and Ohio state tax. The consequence of doing planning to save a federal estate tax is you lose some of the step up of income tax basis. And, and without getting too much of the de details, you may remember the term bypass trust or credit shelter trust, different terms for it. If you had $600,000 go into the family trust, the credit shelter trust or the bypass trust, all words for the same thing. If you had 600,000 go into that trust to avoid estate taxes, you would also lose the step up of income tax basis on the second spouse's death. So there, you give up something, you give up income tax savings to save federal estate tax. Well, back in the 1990s, Many, many people said, look, I'd rather save federal estate tax because they all you know, had estates more than $600,000. Now with the exemption at 11.7 million existing or possibly as low as three and a half million, many people don't have to worry about federal estate tax. And as I said, there's no Ohio state tax. So their plans may be designed to save something that doesn't exist for them, but they gave up something to do that. The income tax step up and basis rules. And therefore they're gonna cause their heirs extra income taxes. So they should consider, many people have these existing, husband and wife had each had their own trust and had credit shelter language in it. They should consider a joint trust. Joint trust generally, the way we draft them, don't save any federal estate tax. Common law states generally don't use joint trust for estate tax savings. So it's more of a um, um, community property concept. Uh, like California, some states have community property. Many times they'll use joint trust and still try to save estate taxes. We tend to not use a joint trust if we're worried about an estate tax issue. But if we're not worried about estate taxes, then a joint trust may be the solution. And what that is, is that it's one trust for both the husband and wife, in my example. You'll get a step up in basis in the first death, at least half of the assets, maybe 100%, depending on how aggressive you want to be. And on the second death, you get another step up. That's the savings. On the second death, you don't lose that step up. So for many people, again, if you don't have a federal estate tax issue and you had old documents that were planned for that, then you want to consider 
changing your estate plan, possibly going to a, a joint trust. Now, there, there are pluses and minuses to everything. The risk with a joint trust is that you're allowing the surviving spouse complete access to the money. So if the surviving spouse gets married, she may take actions that would make the assets go to somewhere where you don't want them to go. And so some of our clients you know, don't want the trust to serve a couple of purposes, not just to save estate taxes, but to make sure that the surviving spouse won't change who ultimately inherits the money on the death of the surviving spouse. So that's the risk with a joint trust. Now, what if you say, well, you know what? My uh, husband, I'll use my husband as an example. The widow says, my husband died a number of years ago. His trust is irrevocable. The assets are already in there. What can I do to get this step up in basis? Well, you could consider liquidating your husband's trust if it provided that flexibility. Now, some trusts give their, have special provisions that, that allow a third party to authorize you to liquidate the trust, distribute the assets out of the trust. Then if you do that, then the surviving spouse has the assets in her name. Again, it could be the reverse in her name. And then on her death, another step up in basis. Now, there are risks to that. If the trust doesn't provide that flexibility and you do that anyway, the, you know, the, maybe the other beneficiaries, the children or grandchildren, whoever else is the remainder beneficiary of the trust, may complain about what you did, cause a problem. So you need to look at that trust document. Maybe it gives you the flexibility to liquidate it, pay the assets out. There's a mother, m another one much more complicated. Maybe your trust would qualify for something called a, uh, a Q-tip election. It's a, and it's a, it, the trust has certain provisions in it that allows you to make a late election, even long after your husband has passed away, in my example. It could be years, decades. If the trust has the right language in it, there is an argument that you can still file a federal estate tax return electing to treat all those assets as if, as if they're in your estate for federal estate tax purposes. If you do that, then on your death, there's an additional step up in basis. So if you don't have a federal estate tax you're worried about, you're well below the exemption, these are things you should consider to, to save income taxes. Any questions on any of that, please feel free to, uh, to ask. Whoops, let me get back to, sorry, I lost track of myself. Okay, so now let's talk about planning for IRAs. That's a big issue now with all the changes. So many people, one of the largest assets they may have are their individual retirement accounts, 401k plans that roll over to an IRA. Under the old law, we would do a lot of this planning for people. They, uh, someone may build up a large IRA, excuse me. <clears throat> and on their death, we have a payout to the children or the grandchildren, but not the lump sum, but over their life expectancies, which could be 30, 40 years, depending on their age. This was a lot of planning we used to do for clients. It's a great way to pass along a large benefit because if you had, let's say you named a grandchild the beneficiary of your IRA, that might pay out over a 60 year period to the grandchild. So you have all that tax free or tax deferred compounding going for decades. It would just grow to magnificent numbers. Congress didn't like that. They started reading a lot about that in the papers, about everybody doing these stretch IRAs. So the law was changed in 2020 under the SECURE Act and with some limited exceptions, for example, IRAs going to a spouse, the IRA has to pay out 10, within 10 years of your death. So if you, if you have an IRA paying to a child or a grandchild or, or anybody else other than a spouse, the IRA would have to liquidate within 10 years. It's a major, major change in the rules. So as I say, under prior planning, we would have a trust, excuse me, a trust set up for a child or grandchild to have the IRA pay to the grandchild or the trust for the grandchild. And we'd mandate that out of that trust, minimum distributions would come out. You'd have to do that for various technical reasons. So if the trust was to a grandchild, and let's say they had a 60 year life expectancy, the IRA, the trust would mandate that the minimum required distribution from the IRA, 1 60th in my example, would have to come out of the IRA into the trust and from the trust to the grandchild, but it was a small amount. Now, the way it's written, it has to come out over 10 years. So if the trust is written to mandate, and most trusts are written this way, that, was, were, that we're receiving IRAs, 
if the trust was required to distribute the minimum required distribution out of the trust, that meant that IRA, that trust, excuse me, would be liquidated within 10 years. So the IRA pays into the trust over 10 years. By the end of 10 years, all that money is in the trust. And the trust provision says any distributions from the IRA must pay out of the trust. So the trust ends in 10 years. And that may not be what the plan is. Maybe you have a very large IRA and you were hoping that it would last a lifetime of your grandchild. And you were worried that if they got this money, they would spend it foolishly. Now you have no choice. It has to pay out of that trust in 10 years, but excuse me, it has to pay out of the IRA in 10 years. And in all probability, your trust was drafted so that the trust would lick, pay out those minimum distributions every year. And that would cause, that would cause the, um, I, the trust to empty out. I see a couple other questions. I didn't see this on the side here. Uh, uh, yes, we'll send you these slides uh, after the meeting. Uh, I think within a day, you'll get a copy of these slides. So hopefully that answers um, your questions. Let me see. There's another one that I didn't catch. And it says, um, what if your beneficiary is your trust? Well, that's actually, as I was saying, many times we'd make the trust the beneficiary of the IRA. And, and because it was such, a, let's say it was a million dollar IRA paying to a grandchild, you were afraid to give a grandchild that amount of money. So we name a trust the beneficiary and that trust, the beneficiary of the trust would be the grandchild. We do, used to do a lot of those. And then the trust would say, every time any money came from the IRA into the trust, it would pay from the trust to the grandchild. That was perfect when you were allowed to stretch it out over 50 or 60 years, but now it's 10 years. And you may not want that IRA to pay to that grandchild over 10 years. So um, there are some planning we have to talk about in that area. So let me see if I got all the questions. I'll talk about a Roth IRA in a second. Same rule though, as to a Roth. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So the IRA, so you have a couple of choices. You can, you can amend the trust to not mandate the IRA come out of the trust. So in other words, you have this IRA, a million dollar IRA, paying into this trust to the benefit of your grandchild. We amend the trust to allow the trustee the discretion whether to take that IRA that is poured into the trust and pay to the grandchild. So for example, you have a million dollar IRA, you pass away, it pays to this trust over 10 years. You can wait till the end of the 10th year to do this, by the way, you don't have to do one tenth each year. Let's say for some reason or other, you take 100,000 out of the IRA in year one, you put it into the trust. You decide to leave it in the trust. The downside is that trusts pay the maximum tax rate after approximately $13,000, that's 37%. So the disadvantage of leaving the money in the IRA, into the trust is you're gonna pay a lot of income taxes. So that actually is the advantage of taking the money out of the IRA, out of the trust as soon as the IRA pays it out. So for many people, leaving the minimum required distributions in the trust just doesn't make income tax sense because it's too high of an income tax rate. But the disadvantage of doing that, if you take the money out of the trust, as it comes from the IRA, it goes into the trust, you pay it out within that same tax year or within 65 days after the end of the tax year, you pay it out to that grandchild, you've weakened the asset protection benefit of the trust because now the grandchild has all this money. So there's, there's that disadvantage. So you have to make that, you have to do that plus and minus. Do, would you rather pay income taxes on the IRA, but have the asset protection benefits of a trust and the protection against a foolish grandchild? Or would you just say, I'd rather save income taxes, pay the money out to the grandchild and knowing that that grandchild is gonna get this large IRA within 10 years. Now to answer your question earlier about the Roth, if it's a Roth IRA pouring into the trust, then you're, you're in good shape. You can let that money sit in the Roth IRA for that 10 year window after your death, have it all pay in a lump sum into the trust and you don't have to pay it out of the trust immediately because there's no income tax on that money. Now you can have the trust provisions work automatically the way they are. So if it's a Roth IRA, you don't have this concern about bunching all that income into a trust at a high income tax rate. Let me see if I've answered other questions. Yeah, that was the Roth question. So. So the Roth avoids a lot of this problem. So if you have an IRA paying for the benefit of a child or a grandchild and you wanna use a trust 
the Roth is the better one to use if you can vote, if you can use that rather than a traditional IRA, because it's going to cause some income tax problems. I'm going to go on. Are there any questions on that? So let's talk about planning for 2021. You need to review your trust because if you had set up a trust to receive an IRA, the rules have changed. You need to look at it. You need to consider whether you want to give the trustee flexibility not to pay out the required minimum distributions from the trust to the grandchild. I'd recommend that anyway. Even if the trustee decides that it's too much of an income tax hit to pay that IRA out, uh, to leave that IRA distribution in the trust, maybe they just say, I don't want to pay 37% to the IRS. At least they have the choice. They can make the decision. So if they receive an IRA, the IRA names the, the trust as a beneficiary. The trustee can decide, hey, I'm going to start taking money out over the 10 years to reduce the income tax liability to the grandchild, or I'm going to wait the 10 years and just take my hit all at one time or something in between. So I'd recommend if you're still going to use a trust to be the beneficiary of the IRA, that you add provisions to give the trustee the flexibility on whether to take that money out of the trust or not. Okay, I'm going to go on from there. So I'm going to the next documents. So right now we've talked about your living trust, planning there, estate taxes and non-estate tax issues. We've talked about income tax step up and basis. We've talked about Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs and the stretch out rules that have changed. Now I'm gonna talk about some non-tax issues for a moment, actually even still has some tax issues involved. The financial powers of attorney. Now, again, if you have an old financial power of attorney, you wanna review it anyway. The state of Ohio modified their, their uh, statute dealing with this in 2007. Also, sometimes banks just don't like old financial powers of attorney. And finally, sometimes banks nowadays want language in the financial power of attorney saying the bank's off the hook if they make a mistake. In other words, the bank is going to want to see language in most powers of attorney that say, if they honor the document, if you give it a power of attorney to your son or your daughter, let's say, for example, and your son or your daughter have that power, they go into the bank and they empty out your bank account. The bank followed the terms of the power of attorney. The bank wants language in that power of attorney that says, as long as they follow the terms of the document, they're okay. They're not liable. They didn't have to inquire of the son or the daughter, why are you emptying out this account? That's not their job. They want it clear in the document it's not their job. So those are some things that you might want to make sure your documents have because the banks don't have to honor the power of attorney if they don't like the language. So you have to review your document. One provision that was in a lot of, that, were, that people put in their powers of attorney back when there was a concern about the federal estate tax was, were, was to give the power holder, your son or your daughter, or spouse, for example, the right to make annual exclusion gifts, $15,000 gifts per year, per donee. Now, the reason they did that was that if you had a federal estate tax and you were incompetent, to save estate taxes, we tell the power of attorney holder to start giving away 15,000 a year to each donee that would reduce the estate, not reduce the amount of exemption the person had and potentially reduce estate tax. But how many people have a federal estate tax problem anymore? Very few. If you don't have a federal estate tax problem, why have language like that in the document? Instead, you might wanna consider actually broadening it to unlimited gifting. Now, why would you do that? The reason you might do that is that if you are in a situation where you might have to have Medicaid planning, and Medicaid planning involves basically giving away your assets. And there are all sorts of special rules about five-year lookbacks and certain exemptions. I'm not getting into that. That's for another day. We do seminars on that. I'm sure one's coming up. I forgot to bring my schedule with me, but you'll, if you're on this email list, you'll get emails of our upcoming seminars. But you might want to have language in that power of attorney allowing the power holder, let's say your son or your daughter, the right to give away all their, their, your assets to them, themselves. The reason you might do that is that way we could do Medicaid plenty. If that language is not in the power of attorney and you're incompetent and you can't make the decision yourself, Medicaid may not honor that, that, that gift. They may say you didn't have the legal authority to make a gift. Now, if you're competent, of course, you can always do this. So I recommend you give that serious consideration if you don't have a federal estate tax problem, but you may have a Medicaid, a nursing home problem, and you may and you may be thinking about Medicaid plan, then you want language like that in your power of attorney. Any questions on that? Yeah, I see one question. Let's see what this is.
can the power of attorney, let's say in my example, the son, give a, a gift to himself? Yes. The answer is if you you've got to put some language in the in the document to make it clear that there can be self-dealing, that the, the power holder, the son in my example, can give money to himself. But if you do that, yes, he he can. Now, the issue that may pop up sometimes is, you know, do you, are you, there's no, typically, we don't mandate that the son, in my example, give an equal gift to each of the siblings. So let me give an example. Let's say you have three children and the son, son number one is the power of attorney. I typically do not mandate that he has to give equal gifts to each, each of the children. He could be stingy and give it all to himself. Now, why don't I mandate equal gifts? But let's say you have that language in the document and you want to start doing some planning. Medicaid planning, but one of your children has a creditor problem. Well, we don't want to give that, that child with a creditor problem some of your assets because the creditor is going to grab it. So we won't give that money to that child that has a creditor problem. We'll give it to the other two. Well, if your power of attorney mandates that gifts have to be equal, then you're done. You can't do anything about it. So I generally allow the child, the son in my example, the ability to give away all the money to anybody. I, by that, I mean any of the children or grandchildren or spouses, we typically allow that. But it's, it's, a, it's a blank slate. You can put language in the way you want it. Sometimes, I try to avoid this now, I used to do this a lot more, but if you want, we can put in there that all the, all the children have to agree on gifts. That's a way to stop one child from being uh, selfish. But you know, if you're worried about that for that child, maybe that child's not the right person to be your power holder. Okay, another question's come in. Let's see what this is. Okay, this is a good question. Like I, I just finished the signing where I bring this up. Can the should you give this document to the power holder? Well, I've been talking about what are called the media powers of attorney. Uh, there are there are two types. There's one that's called a springing power that's only effective if a doctor says you're unable to handle your affairs, and one that's an immediate power. It's effective as soon as it's signed. It's a blank check. So I typically tell my clients, don't give your kids that document. Tell them you have it. Tell them you've got it in your left-hand desk or at the house so they know where it is, but don't give it to them. They don't need it always. They just need it if, if, if something comes up and it's never an emergency that they have to have it that instant, they just come into the house and get it. We also, if we're doing your documents, we keep two originals. And I usually tell my clients, give, give your children my business card, they know who I am. So if you've hidden the documents too well, you moved them and you forgot to tell them you moved them and they need that power of attorney, I'm gonna have a copy of it, an original actually, I'll have two originals. And what I have, we, we have you sign a letter and the letter says, don't give that document to my kids until I try to track you down and make sure you're, you're okay or that you're not okay. Find out why your kids are in my lobby asking for that document. So I generally advise, don't give them the document, tell them it exists, tell them you've got it in your house, in your desk drawer, tell them we exist and we have some originals and if they need it, then we could do that. Got another question. So let me see where we are with this. Uh, actually, the question, whoever did it, it just says, Mr. Solomon, I don't see anything more. So uh, so I guess you're typing maybe, but or you stopped. Anyway, uh, ask any more questions if you want. Oh, wait a minute, now another one's come in. Maybe I'm not looking, there it is. Oh, here it is. If we made separate trust and named our children in order of succession to handle the trust, would that be considered a power of attorney? No, that's your trustee. Power of attorney and, and the trustees are different entities, different people, uh, not different people, different uh, uh, capacities. So for example, if you have a trust and you've titled your assets in the trust, the power of attorney is irrelevant. So for uh, so a, a better example, let's say you name your son the trustee but you name your daughter the power holder, the first power holder, and you have money in the trust. Your daughter, who only is a power of attorney, she can't do anything with that money in the trust because your son is the trustee. He controls that asset. Likewise, if you have an IRA, the IRA is not in a trust while you're alive. It's your IRA. The son who's the trustee can't do anything with the IRA. The power of attorney can. So each one's a separate document and it's a separate authority over different assets. Let me move on. Uh, let's see. Make sure I covered that. Yeah, I did. Okay. I keep flipping around the wrong place one more time. Okay, there it goes. Healthcare power of attorney and living will. 
Now, these are form documents. They're approved by the Ohio Bar Association, the Ohio Medical Association, and, and they're pre-printed forms. That's what we use. We don't use our own anymore. A long time we stopped. A long time ago we stopped. Because if you're in a hospital, they want to see a document they're familiar with. And those forms have the insignias at the bottom of the Ohio Bar, the Ohio Medical Association, a few other associations. So they know it's the same document they've seen over and over. I recommend you look at it. You know, things may have changed. Maybe you want different people on your healthcare power and living will. So make sure you, you update those. And also if you're a snowbird, I have a lot of clients, let's say who uh, go to Florida in the winter. You ought to get Florida documents for Florida and you know, Ohio for Ohio, because they're different. And these are very state specific. So you wanna make sure you get, a, uh, you know, we use some Florida council down there to prepare those documents for our Florida clients. So you want a specific document, if it's a different state, then make sure you have an attorney from who's qualified to practice in that state, prepare documents for at least the healthcare power of attorney and living will. <clears throat> I don't necessarily say you have to do that for financial power. Financial powers are good everywhere, though if you're in Florida, they make it more difficult. So sometimes you need a new document for that. So I have a few more questions. Let me try to get to those. Um, so the question is, my wife and I do not have any children and our beneficiaries are our trust. Is it a good idea to keep the IRA beneficiaries as the trust when individual families to have our assets? Well, you know, I can't, I can't really tell you whether it's a good idea or bad idea. It, it's, 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 it's just not that easy. It depends on how much we're talking about, um, you know, what controls you want on the money, how many people there are, it's, unfortunately, it's not an easy answer to that. It's, it's part of the planning process, which I'm going to take the opportunity to mention, and I'll mention at the end of the seminar. Um, what I encourage you to do uh, is, if, is to re review all your documents. If it's set up a personal planning appointment with me or one of my law partners, we'll look at all your documents. We'll, we'll analyze them for you. We'll, we'll decide if we, if we think you need to make any changes, and you can decide if you want to make any changes. Sometimes we're done with the meeting. We say, there's nothing to do. It's all fine. But either way, it'd be a good opportunity to review your documents and make sure they're fine. We charge a meeting fee for that, a fixed fee for the entire meeting. If you've gone to the seminar and you identify that you went to the seminar, we charge you $275. And I think you'll find it worthwhile if you have documents and they've been a while since you've looked at them, it'd be time to review them and make sure uh, that, that they satisfy your needs. And I'll mention this again later, and you, all you have to do is call our office or email uh, Debbie, who sent you the invite, and tell her you'd like to set up a meeting. Let me see, I've got a few more questions. Let me see. Um, uh, we have a power of attorney as each of us owning, uh, should we make separate power of attorney? Well, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but it, you should have a separate power of attorney naming whoever, it is, and, a, and the trust, if you have a trust, you should have successor trustees in your trust and a separate document for the power of attorney naming uh, who you want to be the power of attorney. Many, many times, it's one of the same people, the same order, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if you move, will another state accept these if they're an official Ohio versions? Okay, so good question. Move to a different state. Your trust and your last will and testament are valid in any state. Your financial power of attorney is valid in any state. Healthcare powers and living wills, living wills are very state specific. So I reckon, even though it's a valid document, I strongly urge you, one of the first things you do is to get that document updated. However, I also urge you to meet with someone who's licensed in that state to review your documents. So if you're moving to Florida, and you're gonna become a resident or Tennessee or Texas or wherever, you're gonna to move to a new state and become a resident of that state then you should have a person who's licensed in that state review your documents because there may be some quirks under state law that you need to get addressed. Now, if you're just vacationing in a state or you, as I say, a snowboard example, three or four months, but Ohio is your domicile, you don't need to change your last will and testament or your trust. Uh, you do need to at least get another set of healthcare powers and living wills, they even call them slightly different things. And with my Florida clients, sometimes we suggest to get a financial power of attorney, even though it's not necessary because Florida likes to make life difficult for the rest of us. So let me move on. So now, if you ha have a larger estate, 
if you're married with an estate in a range of $6 million or more, you know, you might want to make sure that your estate planning documents will accommodate any potential reduction if Biden passes the bill, reducing it to three and a half million apiece, because then you might start having an estate tax problem. And then you should start considering making gifts either to, to children or grandchildren or in trust for them. And you might even consider an irrevocable trust before they change the law. So, you know, it's, it, there's, unfortunately it's tough right now because we don't really know what, what they'll introduce yet. And, and we don't know the effective date, but you at least start thinking about it if you're in that range. If you have a larger estate, if you're single with an estate above $11 million, or if you're a married couple with an estate above 20 million, 22 million, you need to have federal estate tax planning done. Even under the existing law, you're bumping up on the limits. You need to have federal estate tax planning. But if they reduce it, and we had talked to people about this in, at the end of 2020 or the few months up to the election, when at that time, and this is not a political statement, when at that time, many people thought that the Senate would go much more Democrat and the House would go much more Democrat. Excuse me. And it was almost a sure bet that the federal estate tax exemption was going to be changed quickly and retroactively to January 1 of 2021. It's not a sure bet anymore. So when no one really knows what, when it's going to happen. But if you have a state of this magnitude, you really ought to consider doing something now because they can make the law effective as of January 1, 2021, even if it's passed sometime in the summer or fall. And so you should consider large gifts and trust to children or family members, something called the spousal lifetime access trust. I'm not going to go into the details. You can consider a charitably, uh, if you're charitably inclined, consider a charitable lead trust or remainder trust. And again, I'm not going into the details of that. Low interest loans, possibly convert an I, a traditional IRA to a Roth or consider an irrevocable life insurance trust. So those are all things that, you know, for people with significant estates that they should consider. And again, if you have those sorts of issues, you know, feel free to give us a call and we can talk about that in more detail. Now, income tax planning uh, for 2021. So I'm gonna talk about IRAs again, I'm going back there. If you were born on July 1, 1949 or after, the required minimum distribution has been shifted to age 72, not 70 and a half. If you were born in the second half of 1949, you'll turn 72 in this year, 2021, and you're going to, have to take your first minimum by no later than April 1 of 2022. You have to take one more in 2022, and after that, it's once a year. You have that minimum distribution. Now, depending on your income tax bracket this year and next year, you might wanna accelerate that April 1st distribution into this year and spread the, uh, the pain out over a couple of years. However, as you know, if you're on Medicare, the amount, your income levels impact your Medicare premium and your social security might be subject to income tax depending on your income level. So it gets real complicated. Now, fortunately with software, you can do different scenarios or have your accountant do different scenarios of where you put the income and see how that impacts your Social Security uh, and how it impacts the taxation of Social Security. And also, there are tables that tell you the premium increases depending on your uh, income levels for the Medicare premium. So, and also, there are phase outs of your deductions that are all based on income levels. So, there are a lot of things going on. The only way to do it is to have someone do some uh, test examples of your income tax returns to see how it impacts you. Now, if you were born prior to July 1, 1949, you got to be making minimum distributions that the um, for a traditional IRA, not a Roth IRA. By the way, I've been talking about traditional IRAs here, not Roth IRAs, because there are no required minimum distributions for Roth IRAs. But for traditional IRAs, there are. Last year, because of COVID, they waived the minimum distribution requirement no more. So you got to take the money out this year. So let's see, I've got another question. Uh, the question is, do you have to take Medicare after age 65 or can you continue to get your own insurance? Well, uh, you know, I, I, there, there's a couple of things. There's one of the Medicares, and I'm not an expert on this. I should know because I'm in it. But if you don't 
get Medicare, I believe there's Medicare Part A, you should get that, that's free. And if you get it later, then your rate, um, one of your, uh, Part B, I, I'm gonna pass on that one. It will impact your ability to get the right coverage level, the cost uh, levels. If you don't get your Medicare coverage in time, then when you finally qualify, your, your rates will go up. There are different rules if you're working for an employer and you're getting Medicare, but I think you're always supposed to elect Part A. I'm gonna kick the, the ball down the, the road a little bit on that one. There are people more knowledgeable on the Medicare premiums than I am, but that is an issue. So don't skip it willy nilly, check it out. But if I remember correctly, if you don't qualify, if you don't elect in time, when you finally elect Medicare, your premiums will be higher. Let's see what else I've got here. Can you still gift all of your uh, traditional IRA at age 70 to a charity and avoid all taxes, federal, state, or is it now 72? Well, the, the rule you're thinking of is the $100,000 amount. Uh, excuse me, the minimum distributions, I believe, or excuse me, up to 100,000. Uh, and that stayed at age 70. It didn't switch to age 72 for the charitable deduction. In other words, you take the money out, uh, don't take it out, excuse me, give it right to a charity. I believe it's capped at 100,000. Uh, and uh, there, you don't pay any income taxes on it at the federal level. It doesn't impact any of your phase outs, this, that, and the other. But the benefit, the greater benefit also, is that you don't pay any Ohio income taxes on it because it didn't come to you. It went right to the charity. Let me see if I have anything else. Uh, does a Roth conversion count as a minimum distribution of your IRA? If you No, it doesn't. So if you have a traditional IRA of 100000 and your and your minimum this year was four thousand dollars, and you convert it to a Roth. You still have to take that four thousand dollars out. So what happens in essence is you take four thousand out of your IRA, and then you convert the remaining six to a Roth. Income tax wise, you're going to pay it all out, but you can't leave that four thousand minimum in the Roth. You got to take it physically out of the Roth. Okay, let me continue on. Oops. Sorry, we try that again. Okay, so let me talk about. I somehow managed to miss up my order or my outline. So hold on one second, I'm going backwards. Capital gains. Let's talk about capital gains. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm going to go back for a moment. Okay. Okay, so um, right now under the existing law, the ma maximum capital gains rate for individuals earning over 510,000 is 20%, plus is another 3.8% tax on investment income above 250. So, you know, if you're in that bracket, 510, you're paying 23.8% capital gains. If you're in a 10 to 12% bracket, you're paying zero capital gains and everyone else pays 15%. That's the existing law. It's anticipated that Biden is going to raise the highest individual income tax rate from 37% back to the Bill Clinton tax rate of 39.6% if you're more than 400,000. And if you're also subject to a 3.8% tax, that one I talked about on net investment income, your rate can approach 43%, a little bit more than 43%. In addition, he said he's going to put a capital gains rate of 39.6, the ordinary income rate, if you have more than a million dollars of income. So that's going to impact only a few people. Now, sometimes when Congress passes a new tax law, again, they make it retroactive. Uh, so, or they make it or at least a, effective the date they introduce the bill. So people don't try to avoid the income tax rate. So again, I, I'm not sure anyone should do anything on this alone. I mean, unless you have more than a million dollars of capital gains and you want to ensure that you're going to get the lower rate, then you might think about that. But you know, who knows what will actually happen with Congress. We move on. I'm gonna talk about real estate, but let me see if someone else has any questions. There was another one. Oh, okay, capital gains. What are capital gains? Capital gains, if you sell uh, stocks uh, or uh, mutual funds or real estate and you hold it for more than a year, you get a special tax rate, the capital gains tax rate. Not, we're not talking about anything inside an IRA or Roth because there is no tax rate on that. But you, you own uh, stock, you bought uh, GameStock 
for a dollar and it's worth $500. You hold it for a year and you sell it, you get the special capital gains tax rate. If you don't hold it for a year, you don't get the special tax rate. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the short-term capital gain, but a, that's basically the ordinary income tax rate. But you sell real estate or, or um, you know, stocks or bonds sometimes if they go up in value, mutual funds, you're gonna get a special tax rate, a capital gains rate, if you hold it long enough at a lower tax rate. So that's, uh, real estate has actually multiple tax rates. So some of it might be ordinary income, real estate, some of it is a special capital gains rate of 25%. And some of it's the 23.8%. Uh, it gets very convoluted uh, and I'm not gonna get into the details. So real estate has various ca uh, capital gains rates, but basically it's a capital asset being sold. So I made that way too complicated. Let me try that again. Stocks or bonds, mutual funds, the capital gains rate is either 0% if you're in the lower bracket, 15% if you're in the middle brackets, 20% to 23.8% in, in the high bracket. Real estate, capital gains, basically the same brackets I talked about, except if you took depreciation, you might have some ordinary income tax rates on recapturing depreciation or 25% on recapturing depreciation. <clears throat> That's as simple as I can make it. Sorry, let me see what else we have in my questions. Um, this question asked me about what tax form to file if they sell some property that had some income and capital gains. Um, can we just do a Schedule D? I think I'm going to punt a little bit on that. I think a Schedule D uh, is the schedule you would use for that for capital gains. Okay, let me go on now with real estate. Many people have real estate investments. It's historically been a good investment. Now, if you sell the real estate, as I mentioned, you pay capital gains, some ordinary income and in some of it, some capital gains on the rest. If you reinvest those proceeds in other real estate and you follow certain procedures, you can defer the income taxation on the real estate. It's called a like-kind exchange or deferred like-kind exchange. And it's very complicated. The bottom line, if you get the money in your hand, it's too late. You got to do this planning in the process of selling the property. And many uh, people invest in real estate will do that. They'll buy real estate, they'll sell it, and they'll qualify for a like-kind exchange or deferred like-kind exchange. And then they will defer their gain until later on down the road and maybe hold that real estate, that new real estate, until they pass away. And then the step up of income tax basis rules apply. And they never pay any income tax. And their uh, children never pay any income tax when they sell that real estate they inherited from mom and dad. So there is a concern that Biden is going to eliminate like-kind exchanges on real estate, which means you have to pay the income tax when you sell the property. So if you're concerned about this, that they're going to get rid of the like-kind exchanges and that they might actually um, raise the tax rates on capital gains, you might consider selling the real estate now. Then I'm always reluctant to advise people that because none of this may happen. And then if you sell the real estate, and you don't do a like kind of exchange and recognize the capital gains right now, and it turns out they never changed the law, you're gonna be angry at me. So it, it, I can't tell you that's the right decision to make. It's something to think about. Uh, you can monitor the tax law to see what happens. My fear is, as I said, sometimes like kind of exchanges would be a perfect example. If it's introduced into the House of, Representative on, uh, House of Representatives on May 1st, let's say, that a new tax law we're proposing and it's going to eliminate like-kind exchanges. They may actually say for any like-kind exchange that occurred on or after May 1st. So even if it takes three months for the law to pass, it doesn't pass until September, it may bind anyone on May 1st. So we don't know. That's the real problem. Let me see if we have another question. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, but I'll come back anyway. Let me get by that. If I sold a long-time residence, put money immediately into a trust, does that trust pay capital gains tax when I die? Well, first of all, if we're talking about your personal residence, remember a single person can permanently exclude $250,000 of the income tax when they sell their house, a married couple, 500,000. So if you sell your home 
there's no income tax if you're within those barriers. And then when the trust gets the money, let me just make sure I'm reading this question right. Yeah, when you put the money in the trust, that's not an income tax event. So there, there's no income tax resulting from that. Now, if the trust makes money after that, then there will be capital gains. If you're alive, it'll be your capital gains. And when you pass away, if the trust makes capital gains after that, remember on your death, there'd be another step up in basis, then the trust would pay capital gains tax. And uh, yes, okay, so uh, let me go on. If you're eligible to contribute to a Roth or a traditional IRA for 2021, do it now. Well, you know, assuming you're thinking the market's going to go up, why not start getting the tax-free growth now? You don't have to wait till April 15th of the next year if you qualify to contribute to these to an, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Do it towards the beginning of the year. Then all that future growth for the rest of the year uh, is exempt. If you wait till April 15th. And it grew in value. I mean, let, let's say you were going to contribute six thousand dollars. If you do it now and it grows a thousand dollars by the end of the year, it's now seven thousand that's tax deferred or tax free. If you wait to the end of the year to do it, it's six thousand dollars again. Now, of course, it could go down. No one knows. Unfortunately, two or three years ago, I can't remember when, you used to be able to change your mind to so convert a, a traditional IRA to a Roth. You could undo it if the market dropped. You can't do that anymore. But consider doing that immediately. Now, uh, that covers what I plan on talking about today. Uh, if you have other questions, you'll feel free to ask the questions. I'm going to go online here and, and see if there are any other questions. I want to encourage you to set up a personal planning appointment with me or Lori Steiner or Jennifer Peck in my office. Uh, you know, we, we deal with estate planning, estate taxes, Medicaid planning, VA uh, issues, uh, you know, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if any of those uh, issues cover you. We look at your documents, you already have existing documents, we'll analyze them, tell you if you need any changes, and then you can decide. Uh, we typically do fixed fees. So once you come in and we look at your documents and know what it is we're proposing, we'll say, we're gonna charge you the following. The meeting fee is a set fee for the entire meeting, whether it takes an hour or two hours, and that's $275. And feel free to email uh, me at the email address on here or uh, Debbie, uh, who, who you received the email from, and, or call our office at the number on the screen there, 216-765-0123, uh, and ask to set up an appointment, and uh, we'd be glad to meet with you. In the meantime, then, I'm going to start looking at some of these questions, see if there's any that I failed to answer. So let me look at here. Hold on one second. Um, oh, someone told me Schedule D, B is for dividends, and Schedule D is for capital gains. That, that sounds right. What's the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA? Okay, well, the basic difference is, first of all, when you contribute to a traditional IRA, depending on if you're in another pension plan or 401k and depending on your income levels, you get an income tax deduction. Or even if you don't get a deduction, whether if it's a traditional IRA, it grows income tax deferred. Why can't I get rid of it? It grows income tax deferred. A Roth IRA, you never get a deduction when you put the money in, but it grows income tax free. If you satisfy certain rules, there's a five-year rule, and I'm not going to get into the details. But if you can contribute to a Roth, depending again on your income levels, the money will grow free of income tax, and there is no required minimum distribution rule while you're alive. When you, when you pass away, it does start having the same required minimum distribution rules as a traditional IRA. A traditional IRA, when you're 72, you've got to start taking the money out. So... A Roth is a great planning tool, and you know if you're in, you're in the right situation. And I talked about it in a seminar I did a month ago, deciding you know you, there's a decision whether if you have a tr traditional IRA, whether you want to consider converting it to a Roth. It's something you should consider. It's not for today's topic, but we certainly can discuss that with you at the appropriate time. Let's see what else we have in the way of questions. Um, Okay, and the question is, can you contribute, what, what sort of income do you need to contribute to a Roth or a traditional IRA? You have to have salary or self-employment earnings, uh, not interest, interest and dividends don't do it. So you have to have salary and or 
you know, uh, self-employment earnings. So if you can do that somehow, if you're retired, but somehow can get a job to to make uh, six thousand uh, dollars, you know, um, um, then there's a, a higher amount if you're older. And there, by the way, there's no restriction now on age. I forgot to mention that. So it used to be you couldn't contribute to an IRA once you were 70 and a half. That they got rid of that. So take a look at that. It might be beneficial for you. Let's see. Um, uh, I, I think I answered this other question. If you contribute to a Roth, isn't that amount part of your income? Right. There's no deduction, but it's growing tax free, which is a great benefit. Uh, are you? Well, the question asked, and I won't get into details about, am I a student litigation? And, and first, the answer is no. I managed to lose a small claims court. I'm not a litigator. I can give you one. And, I, uh, you know, um, this was dealing with some fraud on investments. So if you want to contact me later, I'll try to find, the, you know, an attorney who might be able to take your matter. Um, Next question is, can you convert to a Roth before taking your required minimum distribution from your traditional IRA? No, no, you're always gonna, let's say you have a required minimum distribution this year. You have to take that amount out. You can convert the rest to a Roth, but you've got to take out that minimum. On January 1, the obligation happens. So you've got to do that. And if we don't have those, can I at least roll an IRA over to a Roth for 2020? Rolling over uh, an IRA, a traditional IRA to a Roth is a conversion. And uh, the brokerage companies work with that very well. And I think that's answering your questions. Uh, any other questions? I think I've, whoop, there's another one. No, I think I answered that. Um, okay, I'm looking on the screen, I think. Um, I'll hang around a few more minutes. Again, we have these seminars. We're putting them on every two or three weeks. I uh, relax. And I forgot to get that calendar in front of me to tell you what's coming up, but I encourage you to, to uh, look for your emails because we do a lot of those on different topics. And eventually we hope to have in-person uh, seminars, but I think we're a ways away from that. So I'll hang around, look for some questions. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Please feel free to call and ask for a personal planning appointment. And this outline will be sent out to you within a day. Thank you very much.